Okay. There we there go. There we go. All right, perfect. Well, okay, without further ado, I am uh, pleased everybody to introduce my my guest. Actually, third time we've done this. We did it in yes. our office once in, in mm -hmm. NYU and uh, last year early, right after the pandemic hit. Your third time on my show, and it's a pleasure to have you, Dr. Wendy Suzuki. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me back again. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. We love the work that you do. Oh, thank um, you. My audience, people who follow me, love what you do. And you have a new book out. And thank I've you. you've been on some big shows, too. I, congratulations on that. Thank you. Because everybody you. should have a copy of this book. It's just fantastic. I have a couple of copies here. And here then I, is. yes, thank you. Good anxiety. Harnessing the power of the most misunderstood emotion. I love my cover. They did a great job on my cover, so I like to show it. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I love it, too. So I was, uh, I have the audio version, too, because I mm. seem to learn better that way. And I have your other book, Hard uh, Paperback and uh, Healthy Brain, Happy Life. I love yes. that book. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I was really fascinated by, um, you know, I'm really always kind of geeking out, if you will, for lack of better terms, <laughs> trying to learn more about the brain and how it functions, because yeah. it's so fascinating. We look at this topic of anxiety. Yeah. And I'm thinking, wow, anxiety can actually change the structure of firing patterns in the, yes. in the brain, the activity in the brain. And yeah. if you don't mind, I would love to start with that because I didn't realize until I read your book that that is that that relevant. This yeah. anxiety can, can have that role as well, you know, as all the other roles it can have in causing problems with our health, emotional and mental, physical. Right. But changing right. the brain, how does this work? Yeah, so um, it works because every time we have um, experience of anxiety, uh, it comes with an underlying physiological stress response. And so uh, a large part of how it is re-sculpting our brain in, in the negative sense is through cortisol. So cortisol, high levels of, of um, uh, chronic cortisol, um, we know has terrible effects on two key brain areas that we all want to keep as healthy and fat and fluffy as we can as we mm -hmm. age. And those two brain areas are the hippocampus, critical for long-term memory, and the prefrontal cortex, important for focus, decision-making, it's where our personality lives. And um, those two areas are particularly vulnerable to high chronic levels of um, cortisol, which means they're vulnerable to high chronic levels of anxiety, which means everybody needs to worry because we all have high levels of anxiety these days, which is part of the reason why I wrote the book. So yeah, there is, there is a reason why everybody should sit up and take notice about their anxiety. If you feel that it's too high, that it is draining you, if it is a burden, then this is the book that can help you understand how to turn that volume down, uh, but more importantly, how to take advantage and leverage the power of anxiety to teach you about yourself and also to give you um, gifts and superpowers that you didn't even realize you had. I love that superpowers and gifts, because it seems like within this whole um, anxiety arena, uh, there could be, if we choose to go looking for like a silver lining. Yes. Where you can, exactly. like a lot of things, you know, the, I was just heard a story on the news today about, I, I can't remember what it was, but this horrible situation that happened to somebody, mm. yet something way bigger than the problem came out of it that was good. So it's a silver lining. Yes. And you talk about this in the book. Um, yeah. You have any particular examples, whether they're personal or or otherwise, that, that that you could use? Maybe talk to us about this. You know, turning the negative into the positive, or, or yeah, maybe sure. feeling uh, defeated, where perhaps it's really more of an opportunity if we choose to see it that way. Yeah, I have a whole book full of stories to tell yeah, you about <laughs> exactly that. But let me start with kind of the origin story of the book. So um, we wrote the first draft of this book uh, even before the pandemic hit because I was fascinated with anxiety. I saw anxiety rising in my NYU students. I saw it rising in my friends, my 
faculty colleagues, uh, myself, and I thought, there's something going on here. I, I, I really want to dive into anxiety. And the first thing I realized is, wow, I have a lot more anxiety than I realized. I was an anxiety denier. So mm -hmm. I kind of outed myself. Okay, I, I was going to say, oh, I don't really have that much anxiety. But, but really, when I dove in to, to get started on this book, I realized, oh my God, I, I am carrying around a lot of anxiety. And, um, but then something happened that really changed the direction of the book. It's really the origin story of the book. And um, it was a real tragedy that happened to me and my family. So my father passed away. He was in his 80s and he had dementia and kind of expected it, but but you know, it's still hard when you're when you're one of your parents pass away. Yeah. But the thing that was even harder that nobody could have predicted is that three months after my father passed, my younger brother um, also passed away of an unexpected heart attack you know, most yeah. fit person you could ever uh, meet. And so mm -hmm. that was just it. I, I, I think about it as, you know, I ended up in this um, undesired masterclass of the most difficult emotions that humans go through, not just anxiety, but but grief and and a very, very difficult emotions. And so, of course, it took a little while to get through that. And I found myself asking, you know, what do these emotions teach us? Mm -hmm. What can they teach us? I needed something good to come out. So I was exploring what, what can they teach us? And I realized that these uncomfortable emotions, not just the grief that, you know, the really, really deep ones, but, but all of the uncomfortable emotions that are so typically associated with anxiety, they are so valuable because they teach us about our values what we truly love, what is really important to us. And it is a message. It is a warning sign for us. And so I, it was a really huge mindset shift for me about anxiety. And that's how the book became about um, finding and pulling the gifts and superpowers out of anxiety. And that's also why the book is dedicated to my father and my brother, because it sure. would not have been the same book if, if that didn't happen in the middle of writing about anxiety. And so, um, yeah, it was, I mean, just to give you an example from, from, the, uh, um, from the difficult part, you know, that level of grief uh, was signaling that level of love that mm -hmm. I had for, mm -hmm. for my family. You think, oh yeah, I know, I love my dad, I love my brother, but you feel it in such a different way deep way when they are gone. And I never could have kind of anticipated that. And that that was that was a very useful revelation. You know, it helped me deal with those those uh, feelings. Uh, the grief was the grief. It was it was hard. It was kind of it was the hardest kind of uh, experience I, I've ever gone through in my life to 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 get through that. But in the end, that grief was so deep because the love was so strong mm -hmm. and that really helped me get through. Yeah. I'm very sorry to hear about both of those passings and it is in your book and um, yeah, can't imagine what that's like, but you know, I lost my father five years ago and I, I it took a while. I don't know why, but it seems to take me a while to process anything at all, mm. but it, it was a few weeks, a few months before it really started to hit me. Like, yeah. Oh man, his presence is is no longer here. He's not yeah. yet. He's here. Mm. He's here, you know, mm. and here. So, I still think about that. And um, well, you have so the book is, is full of stories. I love it too because you have examples of um, all these different situations where people yeah. are looking at uh, uh, well, something happens, stresses them out, they're highly anxious yet they turn it into an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, which I love. Do you have any favorite examples or stories th that aren't related to you, let's say? Yeah, sure. Um, I think my favorite one was um, Jared. And this, this is a compilation of, of you know, real people, uh, but we changed the name so mm -hmm. you know, they couldn't be identified. And yeah. um, this was a, a really bright college student that um, after graduation, you could see that there was frustration there. Couldn't find a job, couldn't find a really 
um, um, a job that really meant anything to him. And it was starting to feel like, oh my God, I got this whole college education. Look how much money my parents spent on this. And, and now I can't get a job even at Starbucks. Um, and so there was tension uh, uh, building up and a lot of anxiety. So clearly he, he had anxiety about this, you know, difficulty of finding a, a good job after college. Mm -hmm. Well, um, he ended up doing the best thing that he could do. Um, he uh, took advice from his parents who uh, recommended a um, teach English in a foreign country. It was in Costa Rica. So teach English uh, in Costa Rica and help help uh, and teach students there and also help build new houses there. Oh, and great. so he went on this program and um, I did not see him until he came back. But oh my God, the, the switch, the light switch got, went on after mm -hmm. that. Why? Well, he was outside, he was building houses. Uh, he, he had a lot more physical activity, but he had found this purpose and it was challenging to actually learn how to teach and, and to teach in a foreign language. And, and um, but you can tell that he found his calling. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I, I give that as an example of, you know, uh, sometimes if you stay in the same environment and kind of do some things the same way, you can get in these ruts and, and anxiety kind of flourishes in these kinds of ruts. So I love this story because it was so, it was so um, clear uh, that he had uh, uh, done these kind of, not just mindset shifts, but, but um, he had used so many of the tools in the book, exercise, uh, uh, learning new things, trying new, you know, uh, opening yourself to new adventures. Um, and it worked so well uh, that, um, and he could see it. The cool thing is that he had this clear recognition because it happened so suddenly. He said, oh, my God, I remember how I felt before I left. And look at what I feel like now. So um, it's uh, that's one of my favorites because uh, I, I love that story, too. I love it. That, in fact, we have a friend of mine, one of my very good friends, Ruben, in Costa Rica is watching us right now. Uh, oh, hi, Ruben. he's one of the uh, members of my instructor team for the workshops. Oh, we teach. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, well, so I have a question about that. So we talked in our first interview, we were talking about exercise in the brain, and this yeah. kind of like, you know, in the work that I do, primarily with people with movement disorders, but you know, we're all humans, we all have nervous systems in our brain, right? Um, although there are a couple of people, I'm not sure if they have brains, but I won't say who they are. <laughs> <laughs> As me, I shouldn't do it, but it's just fun. Anyways, we have brain, we have nervous system. And one of the things that you know, when we get get moving. I know that when I, I usually don't feel like exercising. So I know that I have to though, or I'm going to wind up being 300 pounds again, you know, 80 pounds heavier than I am now. And I was already there once and I'm not going back. So <laughs> as soon as I start, like within two, three, four or five minutes, I have the energy to keep going. I didn't want to start, yeah. but I know there's so much that happens chemically and hormonally in the brain exercise is a great tool for me anyways to yes. reduce stress and anxiety right yeah when i get done with maybe half an hour of some intense cardio i forget i was what i was even stressed about mm, yeah and do you find this to be common like straight across the board pretty much it yeah it's like not only common but but you know it's backed by scientific studies that Absolutely. physical activity can lower anxiety levels, depression levels, hostility levels. That's what I've seen in the studies that I've done. Uh, and um, uh, and so it, it, it is powerfully uh, and immediate uh, relief for those feelings of anxiety. And um, it's, uh, it's something that, you know, looking forward to that anxiety provoking situation, we all know what they're gonna be, right? They, we, we can all name them very clearly. Well, shift that, get out of that rut, go and uh, take a nice power walk before you go to that meeting. You're gonna enter that meeting with a very different mindset 
and you will be able to respond to uh, that situation in a more uh, productive way. Um, so that those are some of the easy ones. That and of course, breath work and breathing is mm -hmm. also so powerful. That's actually my number one that I go to in this book because, um, and I'd love all of your listeners to appreciate this. Everybody's heard of the fight or flight response, right? It's the stress response. And it is undergirded by the uh, sympathetic nervous system. So everybody's heard of that. But did you know there was an equal and opposite part of the nervous system that helps us rest, digest, and relax? Nobody talks about that. It's called the parasympathetic nervous system. Right. And the best way to, an immediate way to activate that relaxation part of your nervous system is to breathe deeply and for a long duration in and out because that's what it does naturally. It decreases respiration rate, it decreases heart rate, and it shunts blood from your muscles to your digestive and reproductive organs. So um, uh, that is my number one. Why? Because you can even do that in the middle of a conversation with that anxiety provoking person. They can't even tell you're doing it. And you are there just calming yourself down, ready, ready for whatever, whatever's coming at you. You know, school time is here. You can teach it to your kids. You can do it with your kids and have that tool to pull out of your back pocket whenever your kids are getting anxious as well. It's interesting because as you're talking about it, I was actually finding myself doing that. Yeah. Just right now, just slow breath, deep in and out. And then I noticed some things changed and it's yeah. that simple, you know, yeah. it can be that simple. Yes. And I, I have to admit, I've, I've neglected breath work for the longest time until recently. Mm. And what a game changer it can be for so many different aspects of how yes. we live. It, it really is. It's so simple. Um, it's like there's this a set of simple things that you can do to really make your brain work better. Breath work is one of them. Sleep is another one. Oh. Like, do you do it regularly? Yeah, I do it every single day. Uh, but that was my personal uh, project over the pandemic is to work on my sleep patterns. And um, it led me to not completely give up, but give up for 90% of the time alcohol, because I saw in me how much it affected my sleep. Mm -hmm. And boy, that that was the thing I was doing everything else, you know, uh, turn the screens off, uh, take a nice uh, warm bath and, and uh, uh, do all these other things. But the thing that really got me to sleep deeper and longer immediately was when I added to all those other things, taking away alcohol. So interesting, yeah, powerful. Yeah, I was just reading about that. And um, well, you're probably, probably familiar with Walker, Matt Walker. Yes, and his, yes. Yeah, so interesting stuff he's put out there. Yes. Uh, but I want to talk about your book. Um, you, so you read this book, too, which is really cool for yeah. the audio version. So we get to hear your voice. Yes. One of the things I love about that is you're always um, authentically dynamic. So it's, <laughs> it's, an, it's an easy listen, if oh, you will. Thank you. Yeah, it makes it good because it's really you on the other end. You're the one doing it and putting your heart into it. Um, we started talking about this good anxiety, bad anxiety type of thing right after the pandemic when I we did this last time. Uh -huh. I don't know if you had finished writing the book, but I think you might have been close to it. And um, But now in the book, you talk about the pandemic too. Mm -hmm. and, and, I mean, you mentioned the pandemic. So yeah. I'm curious to know, well, I'll just state an observation that I'd love to get your, your comments or thoughts on this and what you've experienced. When things first hit last year and I was working at the university and it shut down, so I just uh -huh. started my own business. And um, I found that a lot of things changed and not everything was bad. In fact, a lot of things were really good. Like people were outside and moving more. Mm. Um, people even seem to be friendlier <laughs> if I saw them outside and the grocery yeah. store might be a different thing, but still yeah. it seems like, um, it forced a lot of us into this kind of like old school behavior is, uh, let's get out, let's move around mm. or, or we, what a lot of good came out of the pandemic for a lot of people. I think maybe in just self-reflection alone, uh -huh. having the time. Yeah to isolate yourself uh, and not, 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 not even talking about quarantining, just 
being at home so much. I was home mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah. So what was your experience with that? And what, or what have you seen in others uh, as the pandemic has, you know, moved along and we're kind of back more to normal now, but it seems like there are a lot of silver linings that have occurred. Yeah. I think, you know, I was very lucky like you, I, um, I enjoyed and I got a lot out of my pandemic experience. I enjoyed spending more time at home and and uh, cooking more and and um, uh, and well, I was forced to cook more because you know I guess I yeah. could have gotten takeout all the time. But but there was scary periods there. You didn't want you know the poor delivery people uh, were had to be out there with no vaccination. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I ended up cooking a lot more. Um, but on the other hand there were many people that did not have it as easy as I do. I don't have any young children, um, you know, being stuck at home and having to help them through um, Zoom school at the same time you're trying to do Zoom work. Uh, sure. I heard a lot of um, challenges, challenges there. Uh, and then and then it got even almost more uh, anxiety provoking when they all had to go back to school. Now, what was going to happen there and what the rules there and the yeah. rules change. And then you have to be there, you know, at the same time, you're supposed to be half at work, half at home Zoom. So mm-hmm. um, I think, yes, there was a subpopulation that was able to benefit from it, but there were also a lot of challenges. And overall, we know that anxiety levels um clinical anxiety levels went up by approximately 30% uh, mm-hmm. from 2020 to 2021. And um, particular populations were most heavily hit. Um, uh, teenage girls were heavily hit uh, and um, 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 uh, millennial, young millennials. So young people in their twenties, men and mm-hmm. women, and right. also African-Americans, uh, high, particularly high levels of anxiety. So um, there are issues out there. Uh, um, um, so while there were silver linings, there were a lot of people that, that had a very, very difficult time. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why the Good Anxiety Toolbox uh, hopefully will be helpful for, for those groups. Yeah, and it's really the primary reason I'm, I invited you to be here, which again, I appreciate so much is because the information in the book is just so relevant to all of us. I mean, I don't know anyone who doesn't have some degree of anxiety, and huh. I think we, we're supposed to have some. It helps us survive. But exactly, exactly. At the same time, if we get overwhelmed, the tools in your book, everybody, you need to buy it. Just go get it. <laughs> it's it's the handbook. It's the best. <laughs> it's the best. Um, so I do have a question. I want to go back into just talking about the brain. Yeah. Um, if we're experiencing like high levels of cortisol yeah. we i mean we need to have a cortisol correct i mean mm-hmm. yeah when we start our day and we go out, we wake up and we take in sunlight and there's a sleep wake cycle that should start to you know the clock starts so your body's ready to stay awake until the normal time you would probably go to bed yeah assuming you go to bed fairly regular times so there's cortisol production then but this extra cortisol produced by anxiety let's say yeah can lead, lead into actual health issues yes absolutely. Correct? so would you mind just sharing a little bit of, about that without giving away your whole book because sure I need people to buy your book no this is this is um you should hear it here and you can kind of read read it in text to, to really make it stick but um high levels of cortisol, what is that doing? So it's easiest to go back and and think about why was cortisol developed in the first place? It wasn't evolved just to be annoying and to hurt us. No, it, it is the, um, it is the hormone that helps us go into action that, you know, underline that fight or flight. So, um, and all the things that it does, uh, makes sense with respect to, um, taking an action to either, you know, uh, uh, protect yourself or run away. So what is it doing? Increasing your heart rate. It is increasing your um, uh, respiration rate. And it is increasing um, blood shunted from your digestive and reproductive organs to your muscles. So I'm going to start with the body and then I'll end with the brain. So the body, that's what cortisol is is doing. And so uh, immediately, if you have one lion that came at you 
and you ran away and you got you got away, then you could recover. That's fine. That 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 quick burst of cortisol helped you run really fast, so you got away. Well, imagine there's like lions popping up all over the place. Lion, 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 and your heart rate is up all the time. What is happening? Okay, you get you develop heart problems, long-term heart problems, heart disease. You develop um, uh, so blood is shunting away from your digestive and reproductive organs. You get digestive problems, ulcers, very common in conditions like PTSD, which is also associated with high levels of cortisol and long-term reproductive uh, problems. Also mentioned by Matthew Walker for sleep problems. Well, long-term stress will also cause long-term reproductive health issues. Yeah. So, um, uh, those are, that is why we all need to be cognizant of our level of stress. It's not okay to have this high level of anxiety for too long of a time without getting a handle on it. And in the brain, um, the cortisol will attack. Well, first, let me do the good thing. First, it will focus you. So that um, this is the thing that makes uh, the mother be able to run into, you know, the burning building and, and, and find the baby and then bring it out. So her, her senses are, are heightened. Um, right. But long term cortisol all the time is going to eventually damage both the hippocampus, critical for memory, and also the prefrontal cortex, uh, important for decision making, uh, that focused attention that, that got benefited uh, uh, when they were running into a burning building, well, it starts to damage that, that part of the brain and literally make the cells shrink. That's exactly what I was going to ask you, because in your book, I'm pretty sure you mentioned the prefrontal cortex will actually shrink in size. Yes. With, with long prolonged high anxiety yeah. and high cortisol levels. Yeah. No bueno. That's not good. Right. So getting that under control is paramount really for a lot of reasons being able to make the right decisions recognize when you need to make them and also uh longevity it would seem right. like this could shorten your life too right heart yes. problems absolutely absolutely i mean if the model is um ptsd people have heard of it people have a feeling for what what that is long-term high levels of stress um, people with PTSD have significantly shrunken temporal lobe. Their whole temporal lobe is smaller. Uh, and one of the first uh, uh, structures that attacks, again, is this hippocampus, important for memory, in the middle of the temporal lobe. So this is not anything to be uh, 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 casual about. You do not want your brain to be shrinking because of all of this stress. That's what happens. Memory, memory is poor. In, in these patients that have this high chronic level of, of um, cortisol. And um, that is kind of where high levels of chronic stress and anxiety get you to as well. And that is not what you want. I have another brain question, hormones, chemicals. So yeah. take, for example, all the things we have now available to us, right? I've got my phone, uh -huh. my tablet, I've got all this cool stuff, right? And I love all of it. It's so handy. But I find myself going over to Instagram to check to see who liked my stuff. Uh. I don't get enough likes. Huh? Must have been a bad posting time. I mean, I do this. And once in a while, I'll admit it. I'll take it off and I'll wait and I'll put something back up, different hashtags and all that. But I, I almost feel like it's uh, this overflow, overwhelming amount of dopamine that a lot of us get. I'm just speaking in general terms. I'll, I'll yeah. just speak for myself that we, we, we're checking this all the time, we're checking that all the time, and we get everything instantly now. And I think that increases our anxiety levels a lot of times. Yeah. You know, Facebook and Instagram were down for like six hours the other day. Mm -hmm. And it's actually totally cool because I didn't have to worry about checking it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean, though? Do you, would you agree with any of this? Like, is there a... a um, well, Do there's data. We have more stress now because of our lifestyles. What most of us have a smartphone, we have this and that, we have instant everything. Yeah. This increases stress for those of us who don't manage it optimally. It, it does. And in fact, that is part of what the whistleblower for Facebook uh, yeah. talked about all that data that they had. They know that Facebook and Instagram um, make young girls feel worse about their bodies, um, um, make, make them feel worse about themselves. And it's hard to quit 
because it's been designed to pull you in and it, and you know it's doing exactly what it was designed to do it gives you that little dopamine hit when you see the little red um Ooh, you know yes. uh the, the little red heart and um so so that is you know scary uh that 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 happens and um I don't think you or I need to worry that much, although I might eat my words. Um, what is really concerning is the young people, young kids, and they're they're starting to target even children going on play dates. They want to find ways to get them, you know, um, connected to Instagram and Facebook, and that is um, uh, that that is very disturbing. That that kind of control can can go on from such an early age. Yeah, it is. I mean, I remember what it was like to only have an answering machine and to have no answering machine. Yes, and a rotary I remember dial that phone. too. Oh, yeah, the answering machine dial. was high tech, right? <laughs> I remember if you didn't have a machine, you just had somebody call you back, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, so I remember that and I'm kind of, I'm okay with going back to old school, um, although I still find myself wanting instant things because I know I can have them information, emails, everything's on the phone. I can pay all my bills. I can transfer money. I can talk to people. I can FaceTime. I can, but what I find interesting is because like I have, since we talked last time, last mm. year, I have two granddaughters now. Mm. One is 11 months and the other one is going to be six months next week. Oh. And, and they've changed my life. It's absolutely so amazing. <laughs> but they'll never know a world without all of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so fortunately, both of their parents are my my kids are mindful of this because they, they've kind of always had this, but you know, one's 29, one's 34. So they can go back far enough. So we didn't have smartphones. They remember yeah. about it, you know, right, right. But I see what you mean, because this this is a concern for the young folks. And it it really can cause well trigger a lot of behavioral issues yeah or just behavior that we didn't have the option of behaving like because this wasn't around when we were kids right? although i remember you know what i was thinking is i remember when i was a teenager and um 16 magazine is what i would buy you know every whatever once a month or every two weeks it would come out and i remember feeling bad about myself after seeing the, you know, the models on the, on the cover yeah. of 16. And that was just once every while. I didn't even, I, I just saw it in the supermarket. Now yeah. transfer that to every single day. It's staring you in the face, these Instagram posts and, and what um, they're always looking at, you know, these young kids are looking at women, you know, that have a very different kind of body and it's making them feel so bad. And it's like, I, I can't, I can almost imagine it, but not even, you know, from that young age. Sure. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I remember that. Well, with that said, uh, I, I want people to get your book. Uh, what's about, is there any particular place that you prefer they get it from? Or just um, go online and Google it or Amazon or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, you can get it all over the place. It's on Amazon, it's on Barnes and Nobles, but mm -hmm. I always like to encourage people, if you can, please support your independent booksellers. Yeah. They play such a great role in our society. And um, yes, it is a little bit more expensive, but uh, um, I love I love the independent booksellers and those those book readings that I get to do there is some of my favorite things. Oh yeah, that's great. Or you can get the Audible version, uh, which I, I loved recording. Uh, so, so I always love recording my books. I recorded my first one too. Yeah, I remember that. I have that too on audio. Um, love them both. Well, okay. So just one last question. Yeah. If you have just two more minutes. Yeah, sure. Regarding all this, this anxiety now for, let's just say for, for me, I think I've kind of figured out how to deal with smartphones and this and that and instant gratification. Yeah. I can just you know, chill out about it. But do you have any, most of the time, not, not all the time, but do you have any recommendations on how to turn that into something not so anxiety ridden for, or for people who are just constantly, constantly gotta, gotta, you know, always, always check and check and check and get stressed out. Yeah. So 
I, I have two things to say about that. One about Instagram, and I'll just share what my, um, what my strategy is. So, so, you know, I, I get a lot of followers when I do shows like this and, and other shows and I follow them back and, and that's great. But the posts that I like that I, you know, put the little heart on, um, are the posts that, um, are calming to me. So if you can see in my background, I'm yeah. a big tea drinker and a tea, um, aficionado. And so I follow all of these potters that make the most beautiful teacups and um, handmade things. And uh, you would, wouldn't believe the, the wonderful kind of rabbit hole you can go down. And so while I do keep track of, you know, the, the number of followers that I have, um, what I really use Instagram for are those things that, that are beautiful and not, you know, not somebody in a swimsuit beautiful but things sure, that sure. I love that I follow. And I, I feel like in my small way, I've made um, that part of my Instagram um, something beneficial for me. So I don't, I don't go on necessarily to look at how many followers I have. Now I go on to see um, what pretty teapot somebody has for me to look at. Mm. Uh, and so um, I like that. And I think everybody has something like that, you know, not clothes, not, not celebrity culture, but what is that thing that you really uh, enjoy? If it's, you know, mm -hmm. there's something for everybody. I also follow baby uh, alpacas. I highly oh, yeah, recommend okay. that. <laughs> I actually used cute. to own, a, I had a bunch of alpacas years oh, ago. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Yep. I've never seen one. Well, I think I might've seen one, but um, they are just so adorable. <laughs> oh, yeah. and then, sorry, I'll end with one thing, which is my sure. favorite superpower that I always like to share. So this is a superpower of empathy that I talk about in the book. Mm -hmm. And this is one I realized um, that um, I had. Uh, and so it comes from one of my longest standing anxieties, which is social anxiety. So while I'm a teacher and a speaker, you might think, oh, she doesn't have any social anxiety. But when I was a young girl and even through college, I was a shy, awkward, um, wallflower of a student. And I had years of struggling to, I wanted to ask questions in class, but of course I, like so many other students, I was afraid of being wrong. I didn't, I didn't want to do it. It was that kind of social anxiety. And um, I realized that when I got to the front of the classroom, so I became a professor, kind of instinctually, I always made sure that I got there early, stayed late, and talked to all the students who may not want to raise their hand, uh, but, but, you know, it would be, uh, but they wanted to ask me a question. And um, so that means that my anxiety, my oldest anxiety, became a superpower of empathy. And oh, yeah. that's just me. Everybody has their own particular anxiety that they've lived with for a long time. So they know it, they feel it. And my gift and the gift of that anxiety is that you can turn it to the outside. You will be able to recognize that in other people like nobody else and you can help. And so um, the empathy is wonderful. And the last big great thing is that empathy gives you a burst of dopamine. So come for the empathy, oh. stay for the dopamine. Oh, totally, it does. It, I know it does from yeah. personal experience and empathy can go a long way, a little bit even can go a long yes. ways with another person. Huge. Yes. Absolutely. And then you both get dopamine. Yes. So, well, this has been great. So everybody, please go and check out this new book. And I just want to make sure I have the subtitle, right? Yeah. So it is sure. good anxiety, harnessing the power of the most misunderstood emotion. Yes, and you it's got it perfect. Fantastic book, as always. It's really great to see you. Um, are you? Do you have any book signing coming up, like at tours or anything like that? Are you doing any? I stops? am planning a tour in um, in the winter in January, mm -hmm. probably on the West Coast because I've done a lot of things. You know, I'm in New York City, so I, I go on the uh, um, East Coast. But um, we're still, it's just still in the planning phases. And if everybody goes to goodanxiety.com, you'll not only get all the links to buy all the different uh, versions of the books at independent or Amazon, wherever, um, but I will post all of my um, live events there. Oh, that'd be great. Well, 
If I can get to one of them, I will. I'd be Wonderful. Good to see you again. Yes, I would love that. Well, thanks again. Love the work you do. My audience loves your work. When I told them she's coming on, they're like, yes. <laughs> so you've been on some big shows. I'm a little guy, but this means a lot to me and to my people. It really does. So thank you. Thank you. Best of luck to you and everything that you do and keep, keep up the great work. Thank you so much, Carl. All right. Take care. Okay. You too. All right. Have a good day. We'll be in touch. Okay. Okay. I'm going to stop the recording because I'm, I'm doing the recording. So oh, I right, will right. stop. Sounds good. I don't know how the cloud works, but maybe there's a link you send or something like that. Uh, so you, you, it will send you because you, you sent the invite. It will send oh. you a, a notice that the recording is available on the cloud and you just double click it. Perfect.